ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Abraham and he's coming from Krakow and he's going to talk to you about the topic of legal and efficient with application testing without permission. I've seen this talk already, it's a pretty good talk, so uh, enjoy and welcome Abraham. Hi. Just, uh, thank you. Just a quick mention, it's really an honor to be here. I've watched the previous uh, people that have been talking here and it's really like an honor to, to be speaking at this uh, event and just a disclaimer I'm not Polish I'm Spanish but uh, <laughs> we'll delve into that a bit later. So uh, in this talk I'm going to cover legal and efficient web app testing without permission right so uh, and now if this is on uh, so what we are going to do at the beginning is to cover the motivation behind this right like why and how to do this without permission in a legal fashion and uh, we will talk a little bit about the OWTF basics. Um, and then the majority of the talk is going to be a very practical walkthrough on the OWASP testing guide where we will be talking about how to test the items in the OWASP testing guide using OWTF. And then we'll deal with the usual conclusion and questions and answers. So I've been working for over uh, 12 years in the IT industry. I'm Spanish dude. <laughs> and, um, in the first seven years uh, of my career, I was, uh, my contact with security was mostly from a defensive perspective, like uh, source code reviews as a network administrator uh, work as well. And then um, as a developer, trying to fix vulnerabilities. Um, and then later on, uh, architecting um, frameworks and uh, web applications, trying to fix the vulnerabilities at the design level as well. And then in the last five years, I've been focusing more on the offensive side of things. So, and I'm the author of this tool uh, that we'll be covering both in the talk and later on in the demos called OWTF. So what's the motivation of this talk, right? Like the, the problem in pen testing is perhaps best described by Chris Gates, right? Uh, Chris Gates in 2009 at Brucon explained that real world attackers operate like this. Right, so they will discover what makes the company money, they will discover what's valuable to them, and then they will do whatever it takes and they will steal it. Right? So the part that is the most important for us for the purpose of this talk is this part in the middle. To do whatever it takes is something extremely difficult to achieve for a pen tester. And why is that? That is because pen testers have to operate with all these restrictions. A real pen tester has time and scope constraints, right? You can test it, but you cannot test that, you know, all these things. You have this much time to test and you cannot go over that. Uh, then on top of this, the systems we are testing are increasing in complexity, right? Like every time we test something is more complex than a few years back. And the more complex a system is, the more time we need to test it. But on top of this, customers are really willing to pay for enough or reasonable testing time. So. In terms of software quality, the code coverage of security testing uh, tends to be quite poor. And this is why, right? So we need to do something about this, right? We, we need to, to be faster, we need to be more efficient, or it is not us who are going to find the vulnerabilities, it's going to be the bad guys, because the bad guys don't have these problems. They don't have these restrictions. So as I was wondering how to solve this problem, I was thinking that maybe this problem has been solved before. Right? Maybe we can learn from history and try to apply something that was done in the past and try to apply it to pen testing. Okay? So let's look at Spartans as if they were attackers. So at their time, 2,500 years ago, Spartans were the kind of warrior that nobody wanted to fight. These guys were really tough. They were killed as babies if they had any sort of physical defect. They started military training at age seven. Uh, they had to survive in the, country, in the countryside with only a knife as part of their training. And then as a group, they had this fighting system called the phalanx, where they will put together the shields building a wall and the spurs pointing towards the enemy. This system was extremely effective um, in battles. It was used very successfully for centuries. It inspired the Macedonian phalanx that Alexander the Great used in his conquests. It inspired pike systems that were used during colonial times. These guys were brilliant and their fighting system was great. So if there was a room full of Spartans next door, right? Like, I know this is impossible, okay? Just forget about everything, you know, okay? Imagine there's a room full of Spartans next door. 
how can we win, right? If we are mostly sedentary, we have no military training, and we have these guys next door, and we are no more than them, how can we win? Okay, does anybody know? No? This is how the Athenians did it, okay? The Athenians were considered very lame by Spartans. By, for, for Spartan people, Athenians were losers. They were really, like, their, their skill level could not compare to them, okay? But in this battle, up until this battle, the Spartans were considered invincible by the Greeks. Okay, but in this, in this battle, things changed, right? Like the Athenians could win. And they won not because they were more and not because they were better. They won because they fought in a different way. They fought in a way that the Spartans did not expect and they did not fight at all. They threw things. So shooting won, okay? Because they cheated, okay? They didn't fight like one to one. They, fight, they, they fought from far away and that's how they won. So, can we take this and apply it to pen testing? Okay, can we shoot before the battle? Can we start the shooting? Can we start testing before we have permission? Can we shoot all the time continuously in the background while we analyze information in parallel? Okay, and can we prepare more shootings without being noticed, right? So we're trying to do as much work as we can in advance so that we have the higher possible um, likelihood of success. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the three, the three basic pillars behind the um, idea of OWTF. So OWTF is the offensive testing framework, and at a conceptual level, the three pillars are test separation, automation, and human analysis. So the test separation allows us to start before we have permission. We separate the tests that require permission from the ones that do not require permission, so that we can launch the ones that do not require permission first. Automation is an obvious, but uh, we have a lot of talent in the security community. We have a lot of great tools that are solve narrow problems, but are really good in isolation. But if we unite them and we align them to standards, we can take uh, comprehensiveness to a, to a whole new level. And then human analysis. I'll talk a little bit about, about this later. So, uh, Chris Nickerson in uh, Exotic Liability said that OWTF launches OWASPI tools, and that's kind of right. So, <laughs> OWTF will run tools like the Harvester, Nikto, Aracne, W3AF, a lot of tools like this that you might be familiar with. And it will run tests directly as well. So, it automates all these things, right? Like, the, all the tools that you would normally call by hand, it will call for you. And it runs a bunch of tests directly. It acts as a knowledge repository where it will give you links for proof of concept code, for resources. And it will do the OWASP mapping for you. We have a lot of tools that are very good um, in isolation, but they report vulnerabilities in a way that is perhaps not fully aligned with the OWASP testing guide. So what OWTF will do is it will align each tool to the OWASP testing guide item that uh, makes the most sense. And perhaps one of the areas that uh, where OWTF shines the most is the human analysis. The human OWTF, every time a plugin finishes, in the background, uh, a report is built. And then uh, this report is interactive and it allows the pen tester to give a weight to each tool output. So you have an interface where you can flag the importance, paste your proof of concept screenshots, uh, write your notes, and all this. And this is on the fly all the time in the background. So you can start this on minute one. We'll see this a, bit, a little bit more later. So the three main plugin groups, auxiliary, are on the works. Uh, a few are working, but I mean, it's work in progress. Network plugins will eventually be implemented because the purpose of the project is to cover the OWASP testing guide and the penetration testing execution standard. Um, so network plugins will come. And the web plugins are the best right now. So this is what the talk is going to focus on. Uh, this is just a slide to explain that OWTF is not just about the web, so there's the auxiliary plugins are kind of uh, Metasploit-like uh, wrappers around existing tools and things. And we'll see a, a few demos to, to clarify this. I think this, uh, unless you see the demos, you don't really, I mean, you can, but it will be a little bit harder to understand, like from a theoretical point of view. But there's things like spare phishing, denial of service, exploit launching, password brute force, and things like this that the auxiliary plugins do. So it's not only about the web. And what we are going to uh, talk about 
and what allows us to cheat is this fact. Okay, half of the OWASP testing guide can be tested to some degree, right? Not fully, but to some degree, uh, without permission. Okay, and we are going to see how in this talk. Um, so what th this is what we are trying to leverage, right? This fact, and uh, the web plugins are these five plugin types. So this passive will send no traffic to the target. So testing will be mostly through third-party sites, uh, indirect testing, if you want to call it that. And semi-passive will send um, some traffic uh, against the target, but the traffic will be normal looking. It will be the same as if a user was just uh, visiting the site. So nothing, like no real attack. Active vulnerability probing would be like if you're trying to find SQL injection and you're sending like a lot of requests to try to find a vulnerable parameter. So this, for this we would require permission and this will not be covered in this talk because of that. Um, grep plugins are a bit special. They do searches, right? They, they search on the HTTP transactions and they try to find information that might be relevant for us. And external plugins are even more special because they are meant for you to have a way to write your notes. So most tools try to do everything for you and they give you a report and they assume that you are not going to do anything else. But I know that's not the case, okay? The case is that you will always run or you should always run a tool like Burp and Zap or something like this and do some tactical fuzzing and try to uh, test some things manually because the human is always better than the tools, right? Like there's things that humans can see better and this, you are always going to test things outside of OWTF and outside of every tool. So the external plugins give you a way to write the notes for those situations where you find something with burp or you find something with your manual testing. So you still have a place where you can put those notes, those proof of concept screenshots and still leverage all the OWTF interface, even, uh, even though you're doing that outside. So hence the word, the word external. So what we're trying to do is uh, in a normal pen test, you have two stages, right? You have engagement, which is when you are supposed to test and pre-engagement, which is when you're still like in negotiations with the client, you, you're still not supposed to be testing anything. And what we're trying to do is to move as much work as possible from the engagement part into the pre-engagement part. So we're trying to move as much work as possible there so that during the engagement, we have the best chance to get in and we can use this time as efficiently as possible. So the way this works is exactly like the Athenians, exactly what we saw with the Athenians before. You have a terminal window and you have these three pre-engagement safe options. So this is super easy to run. So you have passive, we'll run only the passive plugins. Semi-passive, we'll run only the semi-passive and the grep plugins. And then quiet is a convenience um, switch that will run passive, semi-passive and grep. External plugins always run because they are just like giving you links and stuff like this. Okay, so the idea is you have this terminal window and this is like the Athenian, let's call it the, the Athenian uh, kind of troops, right? So this is doing all the, all the shooting. So this is launching tools, this is doing tests, but the pen tester is not looking at this. The pen tester instead is working here. Okay, so every time a plugin finishes, this uh, report is built. And this is refreshed continuously in the background. So you're always working with a temporary copy, but the um, quicker uh, tests are run first, so you always have something to work from. So you always have automated tests that have uh, finished already, and you can, you can start to look at that. And you have all this interface where you can give um, a flag to each of the, of the tool outputs to give it a weight of uh, relevance in the context of your pen test, right? Like if you think, oh, maybe I can get in this way, but maybe you give it a red flag. You know, this is very personal, but uh, you can, uh, you, you have this interactive interface where, where you can interact with the information and you have the output of all the tools run organized in a logical way. And this, is, this here is a filter actually. Well, you will see this better in the demo, but um, the idea is that you have this interface that allows you to interact with the information much more quickly and, and efficiently. And the human is no longer babysitting tools, right? Like most people, you would have heard a lot of times that these people are, oh, I was waiting until 5 p.m. for the MAP scan to finish. You know, well, here you're not waiting, 
Okay, you do not have permission yet, and you are not waiting. You are starting on minute one. You have all the tools, all the shooting going ahead in, in that terminal window by OWTF. And while that shooting is taking place, uh, human analysis is going on in parallel here without any waiting. Okay, we need, we cannot afford that waiting. We, we, we have a disadvantage with bad guys that we cannot afford that. So that is the idea here. Uh, yeah, so now I'm going to talk about the, the practical walkthrough. So with the robots.txt analysis, we have to consider context, right? If we have a website that only has a login page and all the content it provides is authenticated, then probably robots.txt should exist and should disallow everything. So not having a robots.txt file is sometimes an issue, right? Like in this case. Uh, when, robots.txt file, when a robots.txt file is not found, uh, in OWTF it looks like this. It, you have several indicators there, there, like OWTF is telling you it's not found. The HTTP response is saying it's not found. And then in the title, you, you can see it's not found. If you want to dig deeper, you can see the full HTTP transaction. You can see the raw request that was sent, the response headers, and the response body here. You can also click here to go to that URL in the site itself. So this is kind of a representation for the transactions. Now let's say uh, robots.txt was found. So the file is saved. OK, this is the location. And now for each of the disallowed entries, there's a link built. And you have this open all in tabs for convenience so that, because this is all about efficiency, all right? So, <laughs> so you click on open all in tabs, and this opens all the disallowed tabs in, in uh, all the disallowed entries as, as tabs. Uh, because this is the passive plugin, uh, these links will be built uh, using a proxy. So you will not be visiting, visiting the links directly. You will be doing so through a proxy. But um, if, if you were using the semi-passive plugin, then these links would be direct. So that's the, that's the difference on that. And then um, because this is a passive plugin, we can do testing through a third party site as well. So tool.motorycircle.info is a very good site for, um, for testing the robots.txt file. But the problem with this site um, is that it only takes parameters through post. So initially, like for most sites, uh, OWTF builds links. So the pen tester clicks the link and then that launches whatever on the third party site. But in this site, we could not do that. So uh, I got a request in January. Well, why don't you send a post request? I said, OK, I'm going to send a post request. And I send the post request. But then the next complaint was, hey, in the OWTF report, why, why do you have Google Analytics? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and of course, what was happening was that I was embedding the HTML from tool.circa.info in the OWTF report. And the script was trying to execute, right? The, the Google Analytics from tools.motorisica.info instead of, of uh, OLTF. So there's a cross-site scripting issue if we embed HTML content from a third-party site in the OWTF report. So to prevent this, I came up with this HTML filter. We have here a successful uh, breaker of the first three filters. But uh, <laughs> filter six has been unchallenged. Uh, since two months ago. So Mario and your friends, you're all welcome to try again. <laughs> and uh, that, this is an open challenge in my blog. So if you can hack it, you are more than welcome to try to hack it. And if you can hack it, please uh, let me know, and I'll try to fix it again. And then, so this is the first layer of defense. So this is an HTML filter. Then there's an HTML5 sandbox type frame to prevent scripting, even if, if you get after the filter. And then. Um, this file will be saved in another directory. So this is not saved in the same directory as the OWTF review, so that even if you somehow could execute uh, JavaScript, you cannot get access to where the OWTF review is, which is HTML5 local storage. OK, this is, I can go into more detail about this, but this is not the purpose of the talk. This is just for uh, background. OK, and now during pre-engagement, we can start reporting. Right? Like we are analyzing the robots.txt entries, and we see here, OK, there's an installation entry here, an administrator entry here. You can put together a fancy table like this if you want. And this, this um, editor comes up when you click on the edit um, link there. 
So you have a notes thing that it looks like this, and then you click edit, and this opens this editor, and this is a preview pane. So in here you see how the HTML you are, you are writing uh, is going to look like here. Okay, and of course you can also paste screenshots. Okay, so you see like an administrative page from the, um, from the desired entries, so you can paste a screenshot like this. And of course, um, the next step, uh, the next natural step from this is the magic bar that when you click it, it builds the report for you. So <laughs> you click on the magic bar and it takes all your uh, notes. It takes really all the, um, all the plugins that you gave some severity to and it will, it will sort by severity, so it will put the highest, so this is critical, high, medium, low, so it will put the highest severity at the top, and then medium, whatever, and then it will take all your notes, all your screenshots, and it will show them like this. So this makes it easier for you to uh, copy-paste stuff away from the OWTF report into the real report that you are going to give to your customer. And for search engine discovery, and in general, all plugins have this browse button, right? So all tools that are run, the output is saved into files. So if you click the browse button, you can always see here like the files that are saved. And this is the um, configuration file where OWTF defines how to build links and run tools. So profiles, resources, default.cfg. The slides are going to be available, so you don't need to write any of this down, unless you really want to. Um, <laughs> so just saying. Um, and all tools that are run, you, you have like the full command that was run. If you find a better way of running a tool, uh, I would be happy to, to fix it. Um, so this is how it looks, like the full command that was run. And then in here you only shown the first 25 lines, the output is truncated, so you are given here a link, and here you have another link to view the full output. So, for search engine discovery, a tool that uh, really shines is the harvester. So the harvester will find email addresses, it will have find uh, virtual hosts, it, it will find uh, hosts through search engines, LinkedIn information and other things. So this is all very useful in the context of a pen test because, um, for example, the email addresses we can use to feed in our dictionaries, right? This is about preparing more shootings as well. So during pre-engagement, we can already be preparing the brute force in dictionaries because we are only preparing the dictionaries and we do not need permission for that. And the same goes for virtual hosts. If we can detect more virtual hosts, then the attack surface of the target becomes greater. Okay, and that's interesting for us as well. The more attack surface, the more likelihood of getting in. Um, and another thing we can do is uh, analyzing metadata. So FOCA is not callable through the command line yet, but um, at the moment what we're interfacing with is MetaGoofield. So this will extract, this will look for uh, search engines, it will try to download all documents, extract all the metadata from the documents and correlate it. Try to find, you know, like in metadata sometimes there's things like usernames, printers, internal locations, internal operating systems from the customer um, environment and all this that can be useful. Now for the entry points, uh, a weak point here for OWTF is that the inbound proxy is not fully working yet. Uh, and the strong point is that because there's a lot of tools that are run, OWTF uh, does what I call uh, scumbag spidering. So instead of implementing a spider, it will scrape URLs from all the tools run. So all the URLs that have been scraped go into this potential URLs database and they are classified. So you have all, you have the ones that look like files, look like fuzzable, look like images, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, during active testing, all the URLs here will be visited and they will be vetted here. So these are the ones that are really found. Okay, so this usually has a lot less noise. So this has a lot of false positives for many tools and this is a bit cleaner. Um, and then you can also review the transaction log. So if you click on that, so you have a logs tab, then transaction log. We'll see this in a bit more depth in the demo. Um, and then in here you see like each URL, the method, the HTTP status, how long it took in seconds. You have the human time here as well. And then you have this, uh, these icons here, like to go to the site, to view the full transaction, the raw request, the response headers, and the response body. And if it's in scope or not as well. 
So that's more or less how that looks. And this is uh, an example raw transaction. So that's how that looks when you click on the F to view the full transaction. A very important thing to do here is to specify an outbound proxy. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you should always try to run a tool like Burp or a SAP or something like this to do tactical fuzzing, right? We, we will, as you're uh, analyzing a website, there will be areas where you will want to perform more uh, deeper uh, test of some kind on certain areas. So by specifying the outbound proxy, so in this case, I have Burp listening on port 8080. So by doing this, when OWTF visits the links found by other tools, all those links that have been found from all those tools, including scanners, including Deerbuster and everything else, all those URLs will be passed automatically to the um, tactical fuzzer. So you will have all those links in Burp just by doing this here. So I think that's quite handy. Okay, now um, for the fingerprint, we can of course try to use the same uh, transaction information, but we have more options. Okay, there's what web is a very good tool for this, and this, this, uh, with this aggression parameter set to one, it will um, do the, the fingerprinting tests uh, semi-passively. So this will just uh, visit the site as a normal user would, and in here you have like a summary of all the information found, which is quite a lot. Um, now, um, OWTF will give you these HTTP transaction statistics for all the matching searches. And you have um, an analysis command in case you want to dig deeper by hand or whatever. You are given a, a starting command that you can use if you want to search in the, in the files from OWTF. Um, so for each of the values found in the headers, you have this search for vulnerability search box that's, that makes it more convenient. So this is like a checklist with the OS testing guide and in here you have like a checklist for each of the fingerprints found. You have a vulnerability search box. So this opens uh, each of the popular sites uh, to search for vulnerabilities and uh, there's obvious, um, an obvious button for convenience here to search all and this will open tabs like uh, exploit database, uh, national vulnerability database, OSBDB. For security focus I prefer the Google search because it tends to find better results. Uh, and then exploitsearch.net is kind of an all-in-one site that combines information from the security focus with the Nessus database and other stuff. It's a really cool site. It's one of the other links that open in, uh, in pop-ups, in tabs. And then the passive plugin will do the same, but in this case um, the vulnerability search box is blank and we have links for uh, other sites to do indirect testing as we saw before and you have the open all-in tabs. And then a couple of sites that open here are Netcraft, which is quite well known. I suppose most of you will be familiar with this one. This is very cool because it does like uh, OS fingerprinting as well. So that's nice. And then build width is a bit uh, less known. This will identify things like CMSs, widgets libraries, and things like this that are interesting for us because um, they extend the attack surface. Uh, Showdown, of course, this tool has been covered to death, but you can search like headers and things like this with Showdown as well. And um, an interesting thing that passive plugins can do is that instead of running tools, they might give you suggestions. So the fingerprinting uh, passive plugin will build this uh, CMS fingerprint table for you with potentially interesting options. So if you identify that the target is running WordPress, then you might be interested in running plugin enumeration with WP scan like this, or a CMS Explorer plugin enumeration, or doing it with Deerbuster, or with Deerbuster only the plugins, you know, so you have a few options like that. And same for other CMSs. So the idea here is that you prepare the shootings where you put this in a terminal window, and as soon as you have permission, you hit enter. But you might uh, save a little, a few minutes, you know, so. Everything is good. And of course, this is not everything that can be done with the fingerprint. Something extremely important that you should always try is to replicate the customer's environment, if you can. Um, so if the software is proprietary, sometimes there are trial versions. And uh, if it's not, if it's an open source pro uh, project, sometimes you can download it from the project page 
or you can try to use oldapps.com, and of course Google is your friend. Once you have the, um, the software in your lab, you can run static analysis tools, you can try to exploit it, um, and you can do all this offline without touching the target at all. Because you're hacking yourself, you do not need permission. Okay, so that's the idea here. And uh, a very cool tool uh, for PHP analysis is RIPS, and I like Yaska for most of the stuff. But um, the idea here is that the static analysis might point you in the right direction about the areas that look weaker, and then you can try all the exploits st and, and stuff like offline in your lab. Now for discovery, uh, we're trying to find DNS records, we're trying to find hosts and things like this. So there's a bunch of resources here. This is actually shorter than the full list. And I'm just going to show a couple of examples. Okay, so robtext.com is probably one of the best sites here. And you can see that Zero Web App Security uh, is probably hosted by HP and it's probably in Austin, Texas. And you can see all this uh, very easily for the visualization of the DNS records that uh, robtext.com gives you. So that's really cool. Okay, and we didn't even touch the site. So this is all like through a third party site. Whois information can be useful as well because it will highlight people in the company that are potentially more important, higher in the hierarchy, right? Like people that register domains are probably more important people and they are good for social engineering attacks. And um, then they are also good to uh, feed your or brute force in dictionaries as well for uh, preparing the, the dictionaries for later on during active testing. Something else you can do as well with centralops.net is you have this service scan option and this will perform some limited port scanning on the target. So this might give you an idea about what's potentially there. Error codes, this is quite basic as well. You can do some Google searches for errors. So the OWTF approach here because I don't like the whole Google API uh, kind of issues, right? Like you have to register these APIs and yes, it's no longer enabled, but if you do a Google search, you can steal uh, some Google API that somebody put in there. It's all messy. So instead of that, I'm doing what everybody was doing by hand, which is just put a big uh, blanket search. Uh, and that's what OWTF is opening. And then if you find no results, you move on. And if you find results, then you might want to tweak it a bit. But in this case, you can see the blanket search worked, worked really well and it found all the errors very quickly. Is you, if you find errors in a website, you can also check them through the Google cache as well. Uh, for SSL testing, ssllabs.com is probably the best site. If you use it, um, you should always check this box. Okay, do not show the results on the boards because if you're testing SSL for your customer, the last thing you want is the um, SSL security configuration of your customer to become public, right? <laughs> Especially if they're, they're paying you for the assessment, right? If, this, if it's not like a hobby or anything. So OWTF will build a link with this box, this, uh, box ticked. And uh, this is one of the, uh, this is a graph that will be given to you by SSLabs.com. So this is nice to paste in your report. It looks like professional, yeah? Uh, <laughs> And then another thing to look for uh, for SSL testing is strict transport security. So a website can set this header and it, it, when it is set, it will tell the browser that uh, from now on, you have to talk to me over SSL. So downgrade channel attacks, so attacks, man in the middle attacks like SSL strip that will try to downgrade the connection from HTTPS to HTTP um, will only work the first time a user visits the site ever, which is extremely unlikely for you to do a man, a man in the middle right in that moment. Okay, so this is always worth uh, looking for. And in this case, we have the statistics. So the statistics are useful because in one line you see what's going on. So in this case, you see like out of 200 transactions, this header was never found. Okay, so this is uh, useful to know. And um, this is like the header value analysis. So the only value that was found is just, there was no value. It's just not found. And in this case, uh, this header was found. So you see like in two out of five transactions, it was found. And this was the, um, the unique value. So header value analysis shows you the unique values for each of the headers. And in this case, you can see like two transactions set it, but you only have one unique value. So the value is always the same. 
and this is a link uh, to an example transaction. Okay, so that's, this is always the same in all WTF for all the header analysis, so I'm just explaining it once. Now for analyzing information in the HTML body, in the response body, we have this interface and I'm going to explain this once as well. So this is uh, always the same and you have like the basic statistics. In this case, we are looking for comments and we see the 17 unique HTML comments found. We see that 52 out of 200 transactions matched and we have these three options to review the comments. We can review the unique as text, we can review the unique as HTML or all as HTML and you have the command if you want uh, to do some stuff by hand. Unique as text is quite self-explanatory. What this is doing is it's taking all the, um, all the comments, it's doing the unique of that and putting it in a text file. So that's it. Unique as HTML is exactly the same, but in here you have links to view uh, an example transaction in which this comment was found. Because it's the unique, this is one of the potentially many transactions that have this comment. And if you want to see all, you have all as HTML. So that's how that works. Uh, the same way um, this works, you can also search for CSS and JavaScript comments, uh, single line JavaScript comments, potentially PHP source code and ASP source code. This all works in exactly the same way. It's the same interface. We are looking for different things. Um, now, old backup and unreferenced files, we can search for these things uh, with basic Google searches. So there's a few blanket searches for this. You have the usual open all in tabs. It's quite basic stuff. And something perhaps a little bit more innovative is uh, this thing. So OWTF has this URL classification thing where um, the juicy stuff tends to fall into things categorized as files. So this grep plugin will put things that look perhaps sensitive in this category, so you might get lucky and find something sensitive here. So this can save you some time. Instead of going like by hand through all the HTTP transactions, you might find it quicker like by looking at the URL, what jumps uh, to the eyes like the quickest. For admin interfaces, we can search for them using Google searches as well. And one thing you should always strive to do is to try to um, look for default passwords on admin interfaces. Admin interfaces are really the keys to the kingdom. If you can get into an admin interface, it's game over, right? And we are going to see an example of this in, in a minute. So in this case, I found that there's a CMS in the system I'm testing that's called Sitefinity. One of my first searches by default password, I find the default path is forward Sitefinity, the default username is admin, the default password looks like admin as well. And I could get in that way, of course, to log in and to try those credentials, you would need permission. Okay, I'm just trying to show here the impact, the importance of this. So in this case, you can see the default location was there. I could get in with default credentials in the default location. And at this point, I can create an administrator user. I can create pages. I have, you know, like I, I'm an administrator, like it's game over. Like at this point, it's, it's no longer your website, it's my website, right? <laughs> so, so. Uh, this, is, uh, this is always something you should have very high in your priority list. If you find an administrative interface, uuh, the search for default credentials during pre-engagement and in minute one of engagement, as soon as you have permission, try those credentials. Now, HTTP methods, you can search, you know, you can send an innocent options request. This is not super reliable, but it might give you an idea of what's potentially enabled. And you can check these things passively. So the sites like hexillion.com that allow you to test this. And this is an example of trying to trace against a, a website. So you can check these things through third party sites as well. Now credentials transport, this is quite basic as well. This is, is just looking for all pages that have password fields where the URL is HTTP instead of HTTPS. So in this case, apart from this that we saw before, we have the total insecure matches, right? So there's 53 password fields where the URL of the page was HTTP instead of HTTPS. Okay, so that's, that's it. And then as you browse in the site, you just should pay a little attention for pop-ups like this. Okay, this is asking me for credentials and the URL is HTTP. Uh, for exploitation purposes, you can prepare the attack with tools like Fireship and SSL Strip. Uh, can be quite, quite handy here. 
Now, this is interesting, right? So some of you might know a guy called Mario Heidrich. You know, like, sounds familiar, the name? <laughs> so this is a very well-known German security researcher, and he was trying to be a nice guy. He found a vulnerability in Firefox and said, OK, I'm going to report it. Yeah. So he's trying to report it, and he's trying to copy his friend Gareth Hayes here. So as he's typing, he saw the full list of users on the Mozilla site here. Including email addresses that I just, um, you know, blanked, of course. <laughs> and uh, the, the thing is, he tweeted about this, he was angry, you know, and, but the point remains that he was only using the site. He saw a user enumeration vulnerability by just using the site. Okay, so you only need to use the site and look around and vulnerabilities are there. Right? Like sometimes you don't need, need to like do a lot of noise, you just look and you see the vulnerability. Oh, vulnerability here, you know, <laughs> like in this case, right? So he wasn't testing anything. And in this case, uh, this is a little more subtle. So in this case, I was uh, testing a sports site and the sports site had a public function that was not password protected or anything. It was meant for the public to search for a competition participant. Okay, so there was something called search participant. And as I saw that, I said, whoa, maybe I can uh, get the full list of participants using this, right? So the first thing I tried, I tried a blank search, and that did not work. But what did work was to search for A, then B, then C, and like that, the whole alphabet, then strip out the HTML, do the unique of that, convert to CSV, and then I had a spreadsheet with all the participants uh, in the site. Not only for the competition they were worried about, but for all the competitions. So as I finished my test, I gave like the, the normal pen test report, and attached to it, I put the spreadsheet with all the participants. And it only took a few minutes until I got a phone call asking like, dude, how did you do this? <laughs> My first I just, you know, use the public search and do this, you know? And the thing is, I think I would have not gotten that phone call if I had not sent a spreadsheet. So the point here is that business people have trouble to understand risk when you give them text files, but if you give them if you give the, same, the exact same information in spreadsheets, they will really understand the risk a lot better because they work with spreadsheets every day. It's exactly the same information, but they will get it. They will really get it. Like if you dump the whole database with SQL injection and you give them spreadsheets, they will really get the risk. You know, like as a business, they, they are really interested in the bottom line, which is just to, um, to make the business money and all this, and, the, and security is always seen as a cost, and they will try to downplay risk. But when you're giving them a spreadsheet, they will really see the, what you're talking about, right? They, you will be on the same page. So always try that. Okay, now for uh, default or guessable user accounts, you will see the vulnerability in the usernames they're giving you to test. So if they're giving you usernames that are based on numbers, you know that you can write a loop that increments this number, so you can guess the usernames. If the, uh, names, if the usernames are based on names and surnames, then you can have a dictionary of names and a dictionary of surnames and loop through that and guess the uh, users like that. If it's um, CMS, you can always search for uh, default CMS users as well. So this is just the uh, basic things you can do here. Now, autocomplete is, uh, can be turned to off in two, in two ways. So one way is to do it at the form level. If you do it at the form level, then um, the application is telling the browser that all the input fields inside of this form should not be stored in the browser, right? If you turn it off at the input field, you're saying only this input field cannot be stored in the browser. So things like credit cards, passwords, and things like this should always have autocomplete set to off, 99% of the scenarios possible. Okay, so. The interesting thing here is that by default, if the developers don't remember to do this, all sites are vulnerable to this. So this is something that developers have to do work, right? Like de uh, defaults are powerful. So if, if the default is this, and this is the default, then everybody is vulnerable by default. They have to remember to do this. Okay, so you should always try to pay attention to this. And one way to explain this to business people is like this. Okay, so you log in and you log out and then you click the back button until the login page is submitted again. So if you get a message like this and you click resend and you're logged back in, that means 
that the password is stored in the browser history and that if a computer is shared at work or something like this, anybody by clicking the back button can log in as someone else who logged out before. So everybody will be able to understand that quickly. Um, in password reset forms, this is a bit similar to the user enumeration stuff where you just look around. You look at the quality of the questions. Can you specify your email address? It's based on public information. And things like this, right? Like what's, your uh, what's your pet? What's your, what is your pet's name, right? That's how Paris Hilton got hacked, right? It was all over the news. So things like this you, you will see like in the quality of the questions. Now for logout and browser cache management, the business way of explaining this is you log in and then you see the home page, right? Then you log out and you see the login page. Then if you click the back button, you should not see the home page. You should see an error, right? You should, you should see something like this page has expired, something like this. If you see the logged in content, that means that the application is allowing the browser to store authenticated content. So that's cool for business people and to explain it, but uh, we need some, static, uh, some, some tools here to analyze the, the headers. And uh, this is how it works. So in HTTP 1.1, Cache control should be set to no cache to prevent this. HTTP 1.0, pragma should be set to no cache and expire should be in the past. And um, normally we have sites that are, um, have a really strong focus on security, like for example Google with uh, back bounties and everything. So Google is doing both. They are setting the cache control to no cache, pragma no cache and expires in the past. So they're doing everything. The HTTP 1.1 and the HTTP 1.0, they're doing both. And most sites have just nothing. So if nothing means that caching is allowed. So again, the defaults are bad for uh, security. Uh, and this is how it looks in the OWTF report. So you have the unique values for each of the headers, right? So it's easier to review. So you have 200 transactions, but you're only reviewing the unique. So you're saving some time here. Um, now, another thing to look for is meta tags. So all these cache control uh, it can be done through HTTP headers, as we just saw, but you can also set it with a meta tag. So these are not HTTP headers, these are tags inside of the HTML body of the response. So uh, this works in the exact same fashion, so cache control, no cache is good. Um, it's, it's the same as before, but it's in the HTML body. So there's this uh, search, search box for review, as, as I, we saw before. Uh, for CAPTCHA, the first thing is to see if it's being used. So there's a Google search for that. And then you can, of course, try to break it offline. You can try to see if CAPTCHAs have been reused, if there's a hash or a token passed, and if you can identify uh, a package uh, that they are running for, for the CAPTCHA module, then maybe you can try to find on for vulnerabilities on it. So you have this search for vulnerability search box that's blank so that if you detect the version, you can use this for convenience. For um, the session management schema, sometimes people put sensitive stuff in cookies, like stuff with Base64 uh, encoded and things like this. And there's a couple of tools that can help us here. So Gareth Hayes, uh, who is a very well-known uh, UK-based security researcher, has this cool site called uh, Hack Vector. So this has a lot of stuff, right? So there's like decode, encode, encrypt, like this, there's a lot of stuff here. And in here we're putting the same base64 encoded string and then that decodes it. So there's a lot of decode options. Um, a couple of handy ones are auto decode and auto decode repeat. So if you are not sure about the encoding scheme that's being used, uh, these options can, can be helpful. And uh, another thing that can happen is that sometimes uh, load balancers We'll store the information on the backend server that the request is going to go to in the cookie. So the first time you visit the site, the load balancer says, okay, you are going to speak to this backend server and it's putting the IP and the port in the cookie. And it's putting a cookie with a value like this. So this is the F5 big IP uh, cookie encoding scheme. Right, so Raul Siles, who is a well-known Spanish security researcher, released uh, in his blog in Tadong, released this tool, right? So this tool um, will decode these strings. 
And with this, by just decoding the cookies, you can have internal IP addresses and ports, which can then be useful for exploitation purposes if you get in afterwards. Now, cookie attributes, the most important here is probably the secure flag. So I'm just skipping over because some of these things are basic and I'm covering a lot. Um, so what I want you to pay attention to here is this, right? So this was the second time I, I was testing the same site. And you can see here that the developers really did a good job, right? Like they, I flagged that the J session ID uh, did not have the secure or the HTTP only flag set and they set them, right? But what happened was that they started to use this Spring framework for Java. And in this uh, cookie, there was a remember me cookie that was valid for a month. And this cookie, the framework was not setting either the HTTP only or the secure flag. So now we have a cookie that is more powerful than the session cookie that is valid for uh, more than a month. And, and these two flags are not set, right? So the attacker only needs one cookie to win. Okay, so it's always important to pay attention to all the, to all the cookies. Um, and this is how it looks like in OWTF. So you have all the unique uh, values for uh, the cookie and then there's a breakdown by cookie attribute as well. So you can see here, like this is a little bit uh, cumbersome to look by um, manually, but in the breakdown it's maybe a bit more easy. Like you can see here how security is not found, HTTP only is not found, you know, so you can see it a bit more, perhaps a little easier. Now, session fixation some years ago, um, sometimes it happened that um, there were these websites where you could set the session ID from the URL. And then people call that session fixation. And it's right. I mean, that is session fixation. But that is not the only way to do session fixation. Okay, so what I want you to pay attention to here is that if the session ID does not change after login, and you can do this as you're testing connectivity, right? Like during pre-engagement, there will be a moment where the customer will tell you, okay, I want you to do authenticated testing, and these are the credentials that you are going to use. Can you try them to see if they work? As you are trying them, you can pay attention and see, okay, this is the, um, this is the, the session ID that I had before, and this is the session ID that I have after login. So you can uh, do this test very quickly as you're testing those credentials. So if the session ID doesn't change, there is a session fixation problem because you can set the cookies using JavaScript. You can fool users to type JavaScript in the URL bar. Or, I mean, that worked with Facebook, right? So, I mean, you can't argue with that. And, and you can leverage an existing JavaScript, uh, an existing cross-site scripting vulnerability uh, to set the session ID as well. So if the session ID doesn't change, there's a session fixation issue is the bottom line here. Uh, other things, like as you are browsing the site, you will see like if there's something crazy, like the session ID uh, in the URL like this, or in this case, I was testing a site and it was making a request to another site and uh, it was retrieving a lot of uh, personal user information and all that it was passing was just the user ID, like there was no random token, nothing. So just the user ID. So by just looking at this URL and looking what comes back from it, you see the vulnerability. You are not uh, testing anything, you're just using the site and looking around. Okay, so this is one of the other things to, to think about. For cross-site scripting, we can look for uh, client-side protections. So in IE, there's this uh, header for XXSS protection, and uh, with this it can be like the IE filter can be enabled or disabled, so it's always uh, worth looking at that. DOM XSS, you can look at the source. I mean, you have the source, it's in the browser. You can try to find, for, uh, you can try to find vulnerabilities there. And another thing uh, to, to check is that sometimes if the vulnerability exists after this symbol, after the hash symbol, then we can even do active testing. Right, this is, in the case of DOM XSS, this is um, implementation specific, right? So it, you can only do this really if the vulnerability exists after this symbol. Um, but then you can do active testing because the request, everything that you type after this symbol is not going to the target site. Uh, SQL injection is very basic. You can try to uh, search for uh, SQL, er SQL errors in search engines. And server-side includes, um, you can see if they are enabled or not, and which uh, methods are enabled. Mm. So this will search for things like this. And if they are found, you can like review the unique and all this. 
And for denial of service, um, what we are trying to look for is this asymmetry where we do very little work and the web server does a lot of work. So we do very little work and the, the, ser the server does a lot of work, so we are more likely to bring it down. Okay, so the, um, the denial of service plugin uh, is a grep plugin, so what it will do is it will search for uh, the times, the response times, like how long each page took to load, right? And we, using that information, we will know which are the potentially best um, candidates to bring the server down. So we are only pointing candidates, we are not trying the denial of service, but we can prepare the attack against one of those uh, potential best candidates. Um, for web service information gathering, the one that works the best is the Google search, and the one in here is better. Um, for the WSDL, you will see the vulnerability in the method names. Like, web services gets rarely tested, so like sometimes you see things like download database or get credit card. Like, if you see a method called like that, like get credit card, like this can be like in, in your in your top priority, right? For things to try like as soon as you have permission, right? So these things, you can see the vulnerability in the name of the method and you're not calling anything yet. Now I want to touch on the same origin policy uh, for a little bit. So the same origin policy says that if I visit a random site on the internet, that random site can send a request to my bank, to my Gmail account and all these things, right? So that request is valid and what's not possible is to read the response. Okay, so because of this, so this read the response is what's not possible. Because of this, the best defense, uh, I guess cross-site request forgery, uh, is considered to be to use anti-cross-site request forgery tokens. So yes, you can send a request, but if the token, if the anti-cross-site request forgery token is not valid, this request is not going to be processed. So that's the, de the defense, right? So because of this, as we are looking around in the site, we know that if there's no token, then there's no defense against cross-site request forgery, therefore uh, there is cross-site request forgery. So we, don't need, do, we do not even need to try it, like it's there. Like if there's no anti-cross-site request forgery token, it's there. And uh, if, there, if, there, if the token exists, then we need to wait until we have permission. Okay, so we'll touch on this a little bit more later on. And then for web service replay, this is kind of similar to um, cross-site request forgery because uh, to prevent the replay, we also need some form of random token or something similar to this. So if there's no token, if there's nothing to prevent the replay, there is replay. And we don't need to try it because, because there's nothing. Yeah. Now for cross-site flashing, we can look for uh, flash files and silverlight files and flash and silverlight policy files. So. There's a few uh, Google searches for all this stuff. And um, the semi-passive plugin will make direct requests for the policy files. Okay. Another thing we can do is to decompile um, flash files and try to find vulnerabilities in the source. There's Flare and, Fla and Flasm are good tools for this. And of course, we can run uh, static analysis tools like Adobe SWF Investigator was released last month. Uh, SWF scans a bit older, um, your mileage may vary. And um, this thing that we saw with the DOM XSS, this always works with flash files. So if you put the has symbol there, um, everything you do here is not going to go to the target site, but it will be seen by the flash application. Okay, so you can hack yourself, you don't need permission for that. Now. We just saw there that we are looking for policy files. And the reason for this is that these three technologies, Flash, Silverlight, and HTML5 cross-origin resource sharing, allow to relax the same origin policy that we touched on before. So this thing that you cannot read the response is, oh, maybe depending on the policy file, or in the case of HTML5, depending on the HTTP headers. So this looks like this, right? So if in Flash or Silverlight, if cross-domain is set to allow star, then this means that you visit a random site on the internet, and then this random site can send a request to the site that has this policy file, and it can read the response, because this is set to star. OK, 
Okay, so any site can read the response. If you read the response, you can read the anti crosshair request forgery token. And then you can send a second request with the right anti crosshair request forgery token. Therefore, having this allow access from the main equals star is introducing crosshair request forgery by design. So, this is a very quick test. If you look at the cross domain and it's set to allow star, and then the sensitive functions like create administrator or something like this on the target, then, I mean, you can take it from there. You don't need like, to brute force, like um, do a lot of uh, heavy testing. Like Just by looking at the policy file, you know the vulnerabilities there. The same thing can happen with uh, Silverlight specific syntax with domain URI set to star. And uh, there's a lot of help in the external plugin for very cool resources and proof of concept code and things like this uh, in this topic. Um, what else? Yes, an HTML5 cross origin resource sharing, it will look for uh, those two headers access control allow origin and access control allow credentials. Now, clickjacking is really the future of web attacks. Um, and um, the best defense here is to have X frame options set to deny. There's something called double, double click jacking that gets around this as well. <laughs> but, um, but well, this is considered to be uh, one of the best defenses against this, right? So for traditional click jacking attacks. And the thing is, if this header is not set and there's no, any of these defenses are not set, so the lack of defense is saying they are vulnerable to click jacking. This is one of the other things to look for. And there's a lot of uh, resources here for cool talks by cool people about this. Um, and yes, this is a lot of information, uh, but uh, in OWTF you have this wrench icon that gives you all this uh, interface so that you can drill down to what you care about. So maybe you want to look only to the flash stuff and the cross domain stuff at the beginning on 50 URLs. So in here you put only the flash stuff and then you click on the I for the ones that have information and it will show you from the 50 URLs only that, you know, and then so you can drill to what you care about and, and give weights to stuff. You'll see this better in the demo now in a minute. So that's it for uh, the presentation almost. So the business conclusion here is that web app security is really complex, right? If you think that uh, web developers can get everything in this presentation right on their own without any security testing at all, think again. <laughs> And, uh, you know, like even last year, uh, Twitter, um, they were doing everything right, right? They were checking the anti crosshair request forgery tokens. They were doing all these things, right? And they still got owned with a clickjacking attack on the tweet button. So, web security is difficult, okay? If you see no traffic or no IDS alerts or no anything like this, it does not mean that you're not being targeted, right? Like everything we've seen in this talk is half of the OWASP testing guide. And this is not going to trigger any alert. This was all done to third party sites and mostly offline. So the bottom line here, if you have a website, is to test your security before it is due, because others will. Uh, the pen tested conclusion here is that uh, if you have no permission, that does not mean that you cannot start. There's a lot of work that you can do in advance. And this can be really helpful, right? Like during pre-engagement, you will know what you're talking about. If you're meeting with a customer, and you know, for example, that there's a lot of flash files, maybe you can negotiate uh, an extra day extension to test those flash files. And you have strong evidence, you know how many flash files are there. And you can tell that to your customer because of this analysis. So you can get extensions, you, you will get better, and, uh, better test quality and you will really get the best chance to get in. Like if you do this work in advance, you will really have your best chance. So the bottom line <laughs> is, uh, is no happy holidays, right? To wait for uh, the MAP scan to finish until 5 p.m. or to wait for tool whatever, or to wait for permission, is a luxury we cannot afford. Okay, no happy holidays. Okay, we have to roll up our sleeves and really try harder. Give it our best shot, do the best we can, and you know, try the to do the best job we can. That's, that's it, right? So I would like to thank all the project contributors, light reviewers, our testing guide contributors, uh, the podcast that interviewed me or mentioned OWTF. And that is the part, the end of the presentation part, before the demos. So any questions until here?
uh, how do you detect um, if uh, cross the quest forgery uh, tokens are present or not? And well, you, you look at the source of the page. Wait, how, do, how does it, the tool does it? Uh, the tool will look at hidden fields. We can go into um, the Moland if you want. Uh, it will look at, um, whoops, where is this? Probably here. Mm. So, but in the hidden fields, how do you know is it it's a C, uh, CSERF token or not? Uh, you look at it. <laughs> yeah. You the OWTF is not smart. It, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, OWTF will show you the hidden fields okay. and the human does the rest. Really? It's not that smart. Okay. It's not, yeah. But I can show you like how uh, it works until, well, yeah. while somebody else thinks about something else to ask. <laughs> uh, give me a second, I'll show you. What is this? Um, cross site. Um, it's a short literary question. Yep. Searching. Does anybody know if there's research on uh, CSERF tokens, how they look like in the wild? Uh, what the typical length is, what the typical entropy is, or something like that? Because that might be interesting, actually. Like, is there a paper on that, or any research on that, or they are being distributed over the web? Anyone? Okay, so this uh, is a good opportunity to uh, show the filter. So in this case, you see, okay, before applying the filter, we have uh, 401 plugins are displayed from four URL targets, okay, which are this. So we have this IP, this port, blah, 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 right? So we have Hackademic. So these are like test sites for learning that are useful for me as well for uh, doing this stuff. And then we have like accounts.google.com. We have a few sites like this, right? So now if I do, if I click on the eye, okay, these filters to only, from 401 plugins, it's only displaying eight plugins that are related to that vulnerability. So you can drill down to what you care about, which is what I explained in the, in the thing. And here you can see uh, the grep plugin. This, the magnifying glass is to center the review on that target. So now I want to uh, center the review on this. So I'm clicking on the magnifying glass here. Okay. And this is saying seven unique hidden fields, and then you can review the unique as text. And from looking at the text, you can see what is the crosshair request forgery token, uh, like the human can see it. Okay. But uh, it, is, it, is not, it is not saying these are the uh, anti crosshair request forgery tokens, it's saying these are the hidden fields. So that's how it works. Um, any more questions? Do you want to see the demos? Yes. Yes? OK. Let's see. Live demo. <laughs> so first I'm going to do the URL ones because they are like related to the talk. So OWTF has this thing called uh, simulation mode. So if you put an S like that, it's going to simulate what the command is going to do. OK? So it's not going to run the command yet. It's just going to show you what it will do. So I'm just going to show that. So it's saying like blah, blah, blah. It's loading the configuration files. It's doing all this stuff. And then it's saying here, warning in simulation mode, plugins are not executed. Only plugin, uh, plugin sequence is simulated, right? And there's a warning for a no outbound proxy. And here it's like showing, OK, it's, running, it's going to run all the external plugins first. OK. And then, um, OK. Too much. And then here at the, at the end, you can see it's running um, here. So you can see there's a moment when the external plugins because there's one external plugin for each item in the OS testing guide, right? And then there's one moment that the passive plugins start running here. So you can see exactly in which order plugins are going to be run without running them. So you, you have an interface to have an idea about what's going to happen. Okay, this might look a little bit basic now that we only have one URL, but if you have like five URLs, it's interesting to see how it's going to sweep uh, the plugins with the, uh, you know, with the different targets and all this stuff. 
Okay, so that's that. Uh, now we are going to um, just run only one plugin. So in this case, with the dash O, we can say, okay, we only want to run the spiders, robots, and, cr and crawlers, and only uh, the passive ones. Okay, because we have like semi-passive and grep, so we only want to run the passive one for this, and we want to run it against this side. Okay, so we do that. And that's how um, that looks. Okay, so that's very fast. And in here, uh, if I refresh this, so this is the initial report. So we have only run this. So in the history, we saw uh, exactly how OWTF was run, when it started, when it ended, uh, how long it took to run that. We know it's complete because, you know, like this report can be partial. So it will tell you it's still running if it's still running at the moment you loaded it. And in here you can see um, you can see that, right? So the external plugin does not do a whole lot for the robots.txt and in here you have this. So let's say you want to do the fancy editor thing, right? So you click on edit and this is the editor. And now uh, I can go, let's say this site is um, a random site on the net. <laughs> and I can, where is this? Here. And I can, well, resolution. And I can take a new snapshot. And I can say, OK, I want a snapshot from here uh, like this, right? So I have the URL where whatever was found. And I have the text, and maybe I don't need that blank space, so I'm just going to grab it like this. Okay, and now I grab that and I copy that to the clipboard. And now I can go here, and I can say, okay, I can start report writing because you can write during pre engagement, right? Nobody prevents you from doing that. So you can say, uh, an interesting, um, you know, screen was found here, right? Something like this. And then here you just do uh, control V and then you can paste the screenshot. So this is the preview pane. And that is this, okay? And this is the how it looks in the editor. So in the editor you can like add more stuff in there, whatever. And now the idea is that if I try to use the magic bar, I'm just going to show this because it happened to me. Like right now, if uh, you do not give a rating, it's not going to show up, right? So I, if now I do like the magic bar stuff that I show in the talk, um, in the findings, uh, it says there's no findings, right? But that is because I did not give it a rating. So it doesn't know, um, it does, sorry, I should explain what I'm doing. Uh, so if you click on the light bulb, that means that you are filtering from all plugins run the ones that have comments where you put like screenshots or notes or something. The ones that have something, so I have the ones that have notes from you. Okay, so I can click here and I can say, okay, this is going to be high severity. So you can see if I leave the mouse over the flag, it's, it's telling me this is high severity or you can put it like, this is uh, critical severity, whatever, right? Let's say it's high, whatever. And now if I use the magic bar, uh, in the findings, we can see this is there, right? So this then is easier for you to copy paste into your uh, real report. Okay, so the idea that I want you to think about here is that all this stuff uh, is going on in the background Right, but we always have things to test. Right now, I'm going to um, to run the next demo, which is this one. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to run all the passive plugins against accounts.google.com, which is uh, one of those sites that does everything right. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to click enter here. So that's going to run all those external plugins, and now you can see there's some plugins that take a little bit more, and I'm going to. Uh, refresh this now before it finishes. So now you will see like this uh, plugin count increase to 84 plugins. Uh, and this envelope 
shows you um, this. You can use this as a queue. This is like the number of uh, plugins that do not have a rating yet. Okay, so you know uh, this is a whole new talk, but I'm just going to explain it briefly. You know, like chess players. I mean, this is inspired in the way chess players think when they play chess. Chess players will first do a sweep that is very shallow, so they don't analyze in a lot of depth. They just uh, try to discard stupid moves at the beginning, right? And they try to see, okay, these are the potential best initial moves, and then those moves they will analyze in more depth. So this is an interface that allows you to do exactly the same, right? We have all this huge information, like in chess, there's this that huge complexity that machines cannot cope with it. So in this case, we have a bunch of tools that we ran and we have all this information and, you know, we need like a way to organize it. So with this interface, you can say, okay, I'm just going to, uh, to have a very brief look at these items, okay? And these are all the items. I haven't not I have not yet looked at yet, okay. And this, uh, so this is the one that we rated. So this is one, and this is eighty three. Uh, are the ones that have not been rated yet. So you have a way. Uh, you do not have to mark in your mind what has been analyzed already, as a chess player has to do. But OWTF does this for you. Like you have this interface where there's a track on everything that you have looked at already. So you don't have to look at input twice, right? Like chess players have this thing like if you analyze things twice, you are giving the opponent an advantage because that, uh, the opponent is only thinking once. So in this case, you can flag things uh, once as well through the interface, right? So you have external, let's say we don't want to look at external plugins because I'm just going to decrease the font a little bit. Okay. So let's say I don't want to see external plugins, so I'm, go I'm just going to filter like that, and I want all the plugins that have information. So this is the advanced uh, filter, and now when I click here, this is going to apply uh, this advanced filter to everything in the report, right? So now I click on the eye, and now all the external plugins are gone, right? So we have, instead of 84 plugins, the plugins that are on target are 12. Okay, uh, and now from this, I can go to the ones that do not have a rating yet. So these are the, all the ones that have information, which includes this one with the flag, but this one we analyzed already, so we can use this as a queue, right? Everything that, has, that is left to analyze, everything we have not looked at yet. So we can have uh, this uh, shallow analysis where we are not looking in, into a lot of depth, but we are trying to flag what's important and what's not important so that we can later uh, go into more depth in what looks more interesting. Okay, so this is more or less how this looks like. And this is the table that we saw before. So here you can see all, or you can see, uh, this is all for doing it on all CMSs. Then this is the WordPress um, fingerprint that we saw in the slides. Then you have the same like for Joomla, for Drupal, for Mambo. So things like this. Um, and what did I want to show? Yeah, so the idea now is that uh, this is the second iteration. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I wanted to explain. So this is the second iteration. So we can see here there was a first iteration. Like all tools that you run, every time you run them, they give you a different report. OWTF works in a different way. OWTF will, as long as you run it from the same directory, it will always merge the results in the same report. So in this case, you saw at the beginning we only had two plugins. Now we have 82, 84 plugins, but they are all in the same report. They, those plugins have finished in different iterations, right? We have the first iteration at the beginning, which is complete, and the second one that is running at the moment we loaded the report. Uh, another thing uh, here is that uh, the review can be exported as well. So you can export the review as text, and the exported review includes the um, uh, Base64 encoded uh, screenshot as well. So you can, for example, uh, you're using a Linux machine for doing the test, but then you want to show this in the OWTF report to whoever who is using 
uh, Windows 7. So you can export this and you can import it on the other machine and still uh, see all the results because this is in HTML5 local storage in the browser. So it's very uh, minimalistic. So it's all just Python is uh, la launching the tools and then the interactive report is, is just uh, JavaScript. That's it. So there's no like flash or anything fancy. Uh, okay, so this was the second iteration. Um, and now um, in the third iteration, we are going to run uh, semi passive plugins, right? And this is uh, another option where we can. You saw like before with the O, we can run only some plugins. With the E, we can exclude some plugins. So in this case, we do not want to run this plugin because it's a bit slower. So we are not going to do this. And we are running the semi-passive plugins on accounts.google.com. So now we are going to touch this site, but we are only sending normal requests. We are not um, sending any attacks to it. OK? So this is how that looks. Um, and now, instead of uh, 84 plugins, we have 104 plugins. OK? So this is just an example on how this looks like. And in here, the runtime is also interesting because it tells you like how long things take. Um, what else? And now, um, just to make it a little bit more obvious, I'm going to run. Um, I'm going to. This is a little bit more complex. So. We, with the uh, dash t quiet, we are running both passive and semi-passive. We are excluding search engine discovery reconnaissance. We are excluding testing for SSL. And uh, we are testing three targets. So everything that you put at the end is a new target. So we are testing these three um, learning sites. So this site, this site, and this site. So now these uh, three sites will be added to the review. If uh, you look at the review before I launch that, right now, we only have accounts.google.com here, right? We do not have Hackademics and the others. We only have this one. So now, if I run this, OK, now this is going to be running on all the others. So as I reload this, the other targets start to show up. So this is what I meant about uh, merging the results in the, um, in the same report. So you can see there. Any questions until here? Or can I just keep cranking? <laughs> so you can see it is uh, the same assessment because we run OWTF from the same directory. So we are merging all the results in one place, right? Like how annoying is it when you're running like this tool and that tool and you have to coordinate where you save the output of each thing so that it is correlated in a logical way and then you can find what you want. You know, it's really messy. So by running all OWTF from the same directory, you can merge all the results and have everything in one place. And now you can like go to, uh, to one site, for example, we can go um, I think this one has a robots file. So this one I can go to the semi-passive and this, um, you can see these are links, right? And if I open all in tabs, that's opening all the entries uh, in tabs, right? So we have this, we have that. This template is blank. Do I have internet access? <laughs> um, I think, yeah, okay. Uh, so you can see installation was not found. Includes there. An administrator shows us this. So you can take the screenshot and all this, right? So it's. Um, um, so it's convenient to, uh, to review the information like this. And you could do now like new snapshot and you could grab this, you know, and all that stuff. So. You can grab it with the URL like this, just for proving it. And you can paste it and copy to clipboard. And then you can paste it there. So 
as you analyze in this, you can say here like, um, um, whoops, administrative strative interface was found here. You know, something like this. And then you do control V and you have it there and then you can give it a rating and you know, so it's all the same, right? You can give it like medium, whatever. And then with the magic bar, uh, this will generate the thing and in here you, you, see, uh, you see this. So that's more or less how the web stuff works. Okay, because I touched most of this in the talk, I think there's really, maybe uh, this is a little bit intuitive as well, like you can filter with the flags as well. So let's say um, I have, I give like each thing a different rating, like I give, whoops. Yeah, that's another mistake. So you should, this is the filter and this is where you put the rating. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to give random flags here to stuff. I'm going to make the same mistake again, oh, because, okay, so um, put in this one, um, put in this one here, and this one, this is like in the case, like you find fun functional bugs during security testing, maybe you want to report them to the developers still, like, because of you are a very nice guy, so there's an icon for that. Um, and now uh, that we have a little bit of variety, we can see here how this works, right? So this filter allows you to then focus, like you would give like a very high uh, initial flag, for example, for things that look very interesting for you, like you think you can get in that way. And then um, this gives you a very, uh, this is like the high view of how your targets look, right? Like in this case, you can see, um, where is this here, that um, you have 79 plugins left to analyze. And here you have 103, and here you have 84. And in here you can see there's more flags here than in the others. So you will have the high level view of which target is potentially the most interesting to get in, right? Which is the potential uh, weakest point in the, in the chain. Uh, okay, so that's the end of the URL demos. I can go into more detail if you want afterwards, but I want to show the AUX plugins if you want. So, auxiliary plugins are a bit interesting. So these do weird stuff, okay? These are not uh, related to the web, really. These are kind of different. So. In this one, we're trying to do a drive-by simulation. So there's a victim machine that runs an OWTF agent, and this agent is a bind shell. So it's a persistent SBD listener. You know, SBD is like Netcat, but um, with cryptography enabled. So you can have a shared password, and then uh, the communication channel will be encrypted with AES 128 bits. So that's kind of nice. and. Uh, so that is one part in this scenario. And then the attacker machine is going to run this auxiliary plugin called, maybe I should give it a better name, I don't know, SBD command chainer, right? So SBD command chainer looks like this, right? Most of this stuff you really would normally not have to specify like this, like this will be, um, defaulted from the configuration file. This are uh, in profiles default, I'll show this in the I'll show this in the in Eclipse, which will be a little bit easier. So, um, okay. So profiles, uh, general, and default. So this is the general configuration file. Okay, where we define settings like uh, if you want to see like American format for the dates and things like this. And then uh, at the bottom of this, uh, there's the auxiliary plugin uh, defaults. So for example, you do not always have to define which mail server and all like this. Uh, these, like your defaults will be here. What happens is that because I'm the one that makes the commits to GitHub, I have all this blank, of course, so that you know you don't hack me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the idea is that you would put here like your uh, personal stuff, like 
which server you want to use by default and all this. Then if uh, this is defined in the configuration file and you don't specify it on the command line, then OWTF will default it from the configuration file. But you can always override it from the command line. So here I'm just trying to simplify and give you all the commands in the command line so that you know what's going on. Uh, so we are running, um, so auxiliary plugins, the first thing is that the interactive report is, is not implemented yet. So here we are on the command line. Um, the dash F uh, forces the plugin to run even if it has already been run before. So by default, OWTF will only run plugins uh, once. So if it detects that a plugin has been run before, it will not uh, run it again with the exception of grep plugins that you want to run several times because you want to run them again after active uh, plugins, for example. So the bottom line here is for AUX plugins, you almost always want this dash F. Uh, then we are running only this plugin, the SBD command chainer. We are running it against this uh, remote host, which is in my internal network, it's a VM I have. And then uh, we are specifying that the shell exit method is wait, so we are not going to kill the shell, we are going to wait until the shell closes. Uh, the commands before exit are going to be sleep5 to allow the last uh, tab to load, and then we are going to kill all Firefox. Okay, and then the prefix, like all commands that are going to be run in the agent uh, are no hub, uh, Firefox 7, I know, very outdated, uh, Firefox, and then there is this, um, this drive-by uh, malware site that I have in the network as well, and this is how it starts. So all the URLs start like this, so it's just running Firefox, with a URL that starts like this, with test00 something. And then at the end, it will end all with uh, .html and an ampersand to run that in the background. And then the comma is a multiplier. So we are going to run this for test1, test2, test3, test4, until test10. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to uh, open 10 uh, test malware URLs in Firefox, okay, because the comma is a multiplier. You can overwrite the character that you want to define as a multiplier. By default, the comma is a multiplier. So these all AUX plugins are really uh, a loop. So for each permutation, it's going to run again and again and again. And then the password to connect to the agent is going to be this, OWTF test. Okay, so this is what's going on. And now we are going to the victim machine, which is this guy here. And I'm going to run demo. So the first part is that there is a configuration file called shell.cfg, right? So in this configuration file that is very basic because the agent is very small, um, we are just setting the port that we are going to listen to and the password for the encrypted communication channel. So the password is going to be OWTF test, which is the same as we have in the attacker machine. So that's going to match. And now we are just running it, okay? So we are running the shell uh, agent with the shell configuration like this. And now the OWTF agent is listening on this port. So when the attacker machine connects to this, it's going to give a shell, and then the attacker machine can run commands in the chain, okay? Let's have a look. So, now as I run this, you can see it's overriding settings, okay? So all the, all the settings that you specified on the command line is overriding them, and it's launching all these uh, URLs in the, in, the, in the victim site, okay? So now let's look at what the victim site the victim uh, machine is doing. It's opening Firefox, and it's opening all the malware uh, URLs. So this is for drive-by emulation. We're trying to emulate a user that visits malware sites, for example, for IDS testing purposes. Um, and we can see here how all these tabs are being opened um, by the victim machine without us doing anything. 
okay? Just using the, the agent. So the agent is uh, launching the 10 test URLs, and after that, it's going to do uh, what we saw about uh, kill all Firefox. So Firefox should close after five seconds of loading the 10th URL. So hopefully it will close now. Yeah. And now you can see here that this is a persistent listener. So it was running a shell. Now the connection is closed, but now it's listening again. So the, the attacker machine can connect again at any point to run the exact same test without us having to touch the victim machine. Um, OK, and now, um, for IDS testing purposes, it's interesting to look at the, at the log files, right, to see, um, to see the information, right? Like when, was, when uh, was this run, with which parameters and all this. So in here you can see like the code of the plugin. So there's a plugin uh, report register. So all plugins that are run uh, are registered in, a, in this text file. So you can drill into this and see, okay, when did it start running, when it finished, how long it took, uh, and all the parameters, right? So you can see that there. And you can, the commands that have been run on the agent are logged as well in this, um, hold on, it's a little bit up, I think. Um, may I interrupt you? Yep. So maybe Please. Maybe more, um, when we should close the session. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm almost, uh, almost done. So you can see here like the last 10 commands that opened the, all the commands that were run on the victim. Uh, you can see like the dates, how long it took, it finished, exactly the command that was run, in which machine, in which port uh, the command that was run and all that. So, so you have all this correlation stuff. Okay, now demo two. Uh, this is uh, similar, but in this case, um, the agent is not a listener. The agent is uh, an IMAP client. So uh, the IMAP client has this configuration file with all these settings, right? So this is uh, really uh, in the Etsy host, so don't try that. And this is uh, just the, the victim client. And now mm, I'm just uh, setting up the listener, right? So this is opening uh, Firefox again. And now, if I uh, click enter here, this is going to send a targeted phishing attack with the link, right? With a link to, um, to the victim to click on it. So let's see. Yeah, so you can see that was run. Yeah, I think it's the counter, hold on. Um, track sometimes uh, yeah so this opens the link in the um, this opens the link in in Firefox right as if it was a targeted phishing attack okay next demo now you can see the correlation as before and now the third demo is with uh, the social engineering toolkit so there's a wrapper for that and in here you can see like it's only running the spare phishing module and you have uh, like a lot of options, the SMTP logging, the password, um, the from address, the payload to run, the Metasploit listener IP and a lot of stuff like this and the emails, the file containing the emails to send it to. And now if I run this, this is really a running set but it's running set um, without us having to do anything. So this is a script that contains all the instructions for the social engineering toolkit and is just uh, running it in a way where you see what's doing. So if you use uh, set automate, it's similar to this, but you do not see what it's doing. So with OWTF, you see what's doing. And uh, the scripts really have um, the parameters for OWTF, so you can set your SMTP configuration only once, and it will um, 
it will reuse that all the time, right? So in this case, we don't care about listening to this. So it's just, um, we do not care about the getting the shell back. So we are killing the, the Metasploit listener. And this is just the log to see how the plugin was run on all this. And in here, you can see um, that the email arrived here. So this is the new email that just arrived now. OK, so that's, I think we can leave it there if we are running out of time. So that's kind of a little overview of OWTF and testing without permission and all this. So if you have any questions or you want to know more.